right, thank you. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you here today in the Mesa Lab Auditorium, as well as all of our guests and colleagues who are joining this event via the live webcast right now, uh, to NCAR and to the iconic uh, Mesa Laboratory. My name is Jim Hurl, and I am director of the Earth System Laboratory here at NCAR where together with many of our colleagues in the Boulder vicinity, we do a lot of work on climate, climate variability, and climate change, and are also engaged in trying to effectively communicate those results to the general public. So many of us here are very honored and excited by this event today, discussing climate change in the American mind. Uh, we're, we're pleased to host this interactive event with Dr. Uh, Anthony Leiserwitz, who is a distinguished research scientist at Yale University and director of the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication. As you'll learn more about shortly when he is formally introduced, he has thought deeply for some time about the public's opinions on climate change. I want to thank the Tim Worth Chair at the University of Colorado Denver for sponsoring this event. And in a moment, I have the pleasure and the honor of introducing you to Alice Madden, the current holder of that chair, who will introduce our guest speaker and moderate the question and answer session. In terms of a very brief overview of how this event is going to work today, I'd like to begin by first just pointing out, they will be formally introduced a bit later in the program, uh, three other key contributors uh, to today's events. They are scientists, communicators, who will first be responding to the presentation today. And they are my friends and colleagues, Mark Cerez, Joni Klapas, and Jerry Meal. And as I said, I will formally introduce them uh, a bit later. Um, Dr. Leisowitz will be speaking for about 20 or 25 minutes on this topic, after which we will hear the reflections and comments from the panelists on that presentation. Uh, during that part of this event, I would ask you to hold all questions that you might have for either the speaker or the panelists uh, until the panel finishes their <coughs> comments uh, in about an hour or so from now. And then we'll open it up for a dialogue with all of you in a question and answer session. And after that concludes, we'll have about half an hour for open discussion we then welcome you uh, outside of these doors. You saw the tables being set up in the mezzanine uh, for lunch. As a reminder, this event is being uh, broadcast live uh, on the internet as webcast. And so when the question and answer session does begin, we will need you to speak into the microphone. So we will facilitate that and get a microphone to you. Now it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about the Tim Worth Chair and its current occupant, Alice Madden, who will be introducing our guest speaker today. The Timothy E. Worth Chair in Sustainable Development was established at the University of Colorado, Denver, in 1993. It honors the achievements of the former U.S. Senator from Colorado and current Vice Chair of the United Nations Foundation and the Better World Fund. During their two-year appointments, each chairholder works to foster partnerships for sustainable development that balance economics, environment, and social welfare. Alice Madden, the current Tim Worth Chair, started her career in the high-tech industry and practiced law for nine years before running for office. She served four terms as a Colorado State Representative from Boulder, including four years as House Majority Leader. Afterwards, she served as the Climate Change Advisor and Deputy Chief of Staff for Governor Bill Ritter. She has also served as a Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress and is a member of the Green Growth Leaders and International Consortium focused on prosperous green economies and communities. It is a distinct honor to have Alice here today and it's my pleasure in introducing her, and please help me in welcoming her to the podium. Good morning, everybody. Um, 
I'm Alice Madden, as you heard, and, and if you did the math, you realize this is the 20th anniversary of the formation of, of the Worth Chair, and that's why Tony is out here. As part of the celebration of that anniversary, we had a, a big um, luncheon yesterday. He spoke at um, Denver Law School last night, DU Law School last night, and then today the capstone um, presentation for him. I'm a big fan of his work. Um, as you might have guessed, I'm certainly not a scientist. I'm a policy and political person, so everything I do really relies on good communication. So I've really discovered that it's incredibly important for me to be able to understand you <laughs> and for you all to understand somebody, um, what someone like me needs to be able to translate science into maybe a policy solution. So um, I've seen to Tony talk before, and you're in for a real treat. And I can't wait for the following discussion with your colleagues. So Tony is the director on the Yale Project on Climate Change Communications and a research scientist at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale University. He's widely recognized as an expert in American and international public opinion on global warming, including public perception of climate change risk, support and opposition of climate policies, and willingness to make individual behavioral changes. His research investigates the psych psychological, cultural, political, and geographic factors that drive public environmental perception and behavior. He has conducted survey, experimental, and field research at scales ranging from the global to the local, including international studies, the United States, individual states, including Alaska, Florida, municipalities like New York City, and today we'll hear a little bit about the Colorado results. He's also conducted the first empirical assessment of worldwide public values, attitudes, and behaviors regarding global sustainability, including environmental protection, economic growth, and human development. He has served as a consultant to the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, the United Nations Development Program, the Gallup World Poll, the Global Roundtable on Gl Climate Change at the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and the World Economic Forum. Please help me welcome Tony to the stage. Good morning. Well, thank you, Alice. Um, There, can you hear me? Great, super. Uh, thank you, Alice. Uh, uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you so much to NCAR for inviting me to come back to Colorado. Uh, I should just say on a personal note, um, this is the state that transformed my life um, to get to come back. I spent four years at the Aspen Global Change Institute uh, in Aspen, Colorado, uh, where actually I met and was inspired by some of the scientists that work here. So just the opportunity to come back uh, at this stage in my career is really a, a great honor and a pleasure. So thank you. Um, let's see. Um, so I'm going to talk about climate change in the American mind. Uh, to give you a little more background about uh, the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication, we're interested in understanding what do mass societies understand and misunderstand about the causes, the consequences, and the potential solutions to climate change. How do they perceive the risks, so the likelihood and severity of different kinds of impacts? What kinds of policies do they support or oppose? And what kinds of behaviors are they willing to engage in? Or what barriers prevent them from changing behavior? And by behavior, we talk about things like how people use energy at home and on the road. Their consumer behavior, what, will they prefer products and services that will lower carbon footprints? Do they want to express their views and concerns about climate change through consumer activism? rewarding or punishing companies for their actions. Um, we're very interested in communication and social norms. So how do we talk about this issue among our friends, our family members, our coworkers, our colleagues, uh, as well as these social norms, these unwritten social rules that guide so much of our daily lives. So just to give two quick examples, think about the wholesale shift in social norms we see in this country around cigarette smoking and littering activities that were just normal, just every day, uh, in some cases even glorified, we've seen a wholesale shift in what's expected. And then last but not least is political behavior. To what extent will people not only vote for elected for officials who will lead on this issue, uh, not only will they just support, or, uh, support policies that will help resolve this issue, um, but to what extent will peop are people willing to get engaged as citizens, to actually lend their voice to the demand for broader systemic change? And then to investigate those, um, we look at lots of different scales, as Alice mentioned. Uh, much of our work has been at the national level, and so I'll talk about that here. But we've worked at the state level, at the city level, and then increasingly now at the international level. We just recently completed the first ever national study in China 
uh, the first ever national study in India. And then with the Gallup World Poll, we've been looking at uh, how views of this issue uh, vary across about 130 plus countries around the world. So lots of different scales by which we look at it. But ultimately, as scientists, our question is why? What are those underlying psychological, cultural, political reasons why some people get really engaged with this issue and other people dismiss it outright? Um, so with that, um, I'm going to bring us back to the US context. I'm happy to talk about the international or subnational level if people want in the Q&A. But for here, I'm going to focus on the national level. Um, OK, so let me start with something a little provocative, maybe. Um, and that is a basic statement that it would be fantastic, it would be wonderful if all Americans could have the equivalent of Climate Change 101. A real introduction to how the climate system works, the causes, the consequences, the solutions to human caused global warming, uh, and so on. But it's never going to happen. <coughs> Never going to happen. Now, I am not saying that we should not do everything in our power as a scientific community to make our, uh, our incredibly complex understanding of how this system works as available to as many people as we can, and to get it in, embedded in, as, in the formal education system and in the informal science education. And for anybody that seeks out and wants to know more about it, we should do more than go halfway to meet them and help them understand it in terms they can understand. All true. But that's not going to be most people. So the challenge I'd like to put forward is let's just assume that you've got enough space in most people's heads for five ideas. Because they've got a lot of other stuff going on in their lives. You've got enough space in their heads for five key ideas about climate change. The question is, what would you want them to know not only about the facts of the issue, but are important enough ideas that are going to allow them to constructively make decisions for decades to come. What level of specificity of, should those five ideas be? Okay. Now, I think there's a lot of open discussion and, and certainly research yet to be done about what those ideas might be. They're probably different for different people. But thus far, I and our colleagues think that there are at least five meta ideas that are really important. And actually, a friend of mine uh, has boiled it down to a uh, climate change haiku. Uh, and this does not work. And that's the big five beliefs in 10 <laughs> words. One, it's real. Two, it's us. To expand a little bit, this time it's us. Yes, the climate has changed over millions and billions of years in the past, but this time is different. Third, it's bad. It's bad now, it's going to get much worse. Four, scientists, the experts agree. And I'll come back to this one, really important one. And fifth, there's hope. This is solvable. Okay. Now, you can instantiate each one of these core five ideas with lots of great detail. Fantastic. Keep emphasizing it, all the ways that we know that it's us. That's all great stuff. But in the end, the important point that you want to make sure that people understand is this idea. Okay. Um, all right, so how are we doing on this? All right, so I'm going to take that first idea, that is it happening? So what I've done here is I've taken all the survey data from organizations that have asked one variant or another of this question, is global warming happening? Oh, that's why. Is global warming happening? And has asked the same question repeatedly over time. And so they asked the question using different versions of the question. So that's why we see different results here. But that's not what I'm asking you to look at. I want you to look at the trends. Because they all show the exact same pattern. That basically we saw a run up in public engagement with this issue from 2005, uh, 4, 5, and 6, and 7, peaking out here. And then a wholesale drop on average about 14 percentage points, bottoming out in about 2010, 2011. And then since then, it's been coming back up again. Not back to where we were, but coming back. This broad pattern of an up, a steep decline, and now starting to come back is what's been going on in public opinion over the past decade. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this, and I'll get into that uh, a little bit later. OK. But more specifically, 
Um, only half of Americans understand that global warming is mostly human caused. In our most recent survey, by the way, I'm not going to talk about methodology here. I'm more than happy to do that in Q&A if people want to. But uh, in our most recent survey of just a couple of weeks ago, uh, only less than half of the country understands that it's human caused. Only four in 10 Americans understand that most scientists think global warming is happening. Now, this one's really important, so let me just take a little bit more time on it. Because in our work, we've identified this as what we call a gateway belief. Uh, and so what we found is that, again, only 42% of Americans understand that most scientists think global warming is happening. Further, this is a little bit old, but nonetheless, only 13% of Americans understand that this proportion, somewhere in there, of climate scientists think global warming is happening. Note, by the way, I'm not asking, is, do they think it's human caused? I'm not asking, do they think it's a serious problem? Just do they agree that the problem exists, about which there is no disagreement, even among many of the so-called skeptics? And yet, only four out of 10 Americans understand that. And what we have found is that people who understand this basic fact are more likely to then say, I believe that it's real, that it's human caused, that it's bad for people, and that it's solvable. And in turn, they are more supportive of policy action. So why is this? Well, it's not by accident. This has been the primary strategy of the disinformation campaign. This was taken directly out of the strategy documents for the tobacco wars, including some of the exact same scientists who were involved in the tobacco wars, and said, and imported right into the climate change debate. If we can continue to make the public think that scientists are still arguing about the reality of the problem, people will say, you know what, it's not a problem. And it's perfectly rational for people to do this. I mean, as a lay person, if you don't, if your perception is that the scientists are still arguing amongst themselves about whether the problem even exists, why would you take this issue seriously? I've got a lot of other things pressing for my attention, a lot of other things that the media is telling me are important to worry about. Uh, I'm going to wait until you guys figure it out, when you let, and when you do, you'll let me know, and then I'll take this issue more seriously. In fact, we've actually asked the public if climate scientists were to tell you that nine out of 10 of them agree, would that affect your opinion? And over half of them say, yes, it would. It would make me much more worried about this issue. So yes, it's true that nine out of 10 scientists agree that. Yes, it's true that the National Academy of Sciences and many other scientific associations have said that. But let me tell you, they don't know it. Just because you've said it in a press release does not mean that suddenly everybody understands that basic fact. I think this is actually one of the most important things that the scientific community can do, is to speak in one voice and to say this very simple thing. Okay? I know there's all this other great stuff we want to tell them about, but in some ways, this is the most important. And if there's no simple formula here, but to the extent there is, we like to say that you need simple, clear, and compelling messages. Let's say that again, simple, clear, and compelling messages that get you, not just up here, but here too, um, that you repeat often, 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 that you keep repeating until you're so sick of repeating it that you can't stand to open your mouth again. That's just about the time that they're probably hearing you. Okay? Which is against our culture. Our culture is once, hey, I said it once. Right? I wrote it down in a paper once. Cite it. Simple, clear messages, simple, clear, compelling messages repeated often by a variety of trusted messengers. And we'll talk more about that. OK. And further, few Americans say that they're very worried about global warming. Now, this stands in for a whole bunch of risk perception measures, but this basically captures the main point. Uh, as of our last study, only 14% of Americans say that they're very worried about this issue. Now, there's a number of reasons for this, but one of the dominant reasons is something that we learned over a decade ago. And that is, for many Americans, they still think of climate change as a distant problem. Distant in time, that the impacts won't be felt for a generation or more. 
and distant in space. This is about polar bears, maybe some small island countries, maybe some developing countries, but not the United States, not my state, not my community, not my friends and family, or the people and places I care about. And so as a result, it's psychologically distant. And it's seen as something that, you know, we can put that one on the back burner, we'll deal with it sometime later, not knowing that the pot's blowing over on the back burner. Okay, and that, in turn, translates to public priorities. Uh, here, this is uh, Pew's data uh, earlier this spring, um, and here is uh, where global warming currently sits uh, at the bottom of the list of national priorities, where it's always been. It's always been at the bottom. And moreover, since that highlight, that peak back in 2007, it's dropped 10 percentage points. Uh, the environment as a category dropped 5 percentage points. Energy as a category has dropped 12 points. But what's sort of the top? Economy and jobs. Big surprise. This is something that's right in your face. People are nervous and frustrated and worried about either the job that they lost or that they're afraid of losing or the house that's currently underwater, uh, et cetera. This is here and now. This seems far away. Okay, so we have another way that we've been looking at some of these issues, and it's one of my favorite techniques. And because I have a completely non-representative sample of the American public here, uh, I want to try it out. Um, and I won't go into the underlying psychology, but it's very simple. We can all play along. It's a form of free association. Okay. So here's the question. When I say global warming, what's the first thought or image that pops in your mind? Now, don't say anything. Okay. Now, just out of curiosity, in this audience. Uh, who, please raise your hand if you had something come to your mind about melting ice. Uh, sea ice retreating in the Arctic, ice shells breaking off the Antarctica, glaciers retreating. Get them up high, please. Wow. Even in the heart of NCAR. <laughs> because that's exactly what we see among the American people consistently, too. This is one of the main things most people think of when they hear the words global warming. Okay? Now, this is in part because this is the image, this is the icon that has, become, that has come to represent this issue in many ways. Uh, whenever there's a newspaper article or a news, television news story, what do they always do? They put on uh, you know, some melting glaciers, they sh glaciers calving, because it's so hard to represent climate change in a visually compelling way. But you got you know, ice shells breaking off of a glacier and you know, big splash, and it's great television. Okay. Well, that has sunk home. It also carries an additional advantage because the mental model that it invokes has actually been really helpful in helping people understand that global warming is happening. Because it resonates with a mental model that we all have built up through experience in our bones. We all know that if you walk outside today, especially today, uh, with a glass of ice, what happens? It melts. And you show people pictures of melting ice all over the world and they go, oh, I get it. The world is warming. The ice is melting. Because it already fits something they understand intuitively. Okay? But this also comes at a cost. Okay? Everybody was thinking of melting ice. Hands back up. Keep them up, please. OK. Now, keep your, ha keep your hand up. Keep them up. Uh, keep it up if you live on the shores of the Arctic Ocean, in Antarctica, or next to a melting glacier. Really? <laughs> Nobody? OK, it reinforces the sense that this is distant, okay? that this is happening at the poles, this is happening at high elevations. More of us, there's no people in this picture. Okay? So people do get this A, B, A causes B type causality. Warming causes B melting. And yeah, that's bad, OK? But what they're not doing is A melting is causing B melting, I'm sorry, A warming is causing B melting, which is causing, for instance, sea levels to rise, which is D going to cause you know, coastal flooding and erosion uh, on our coast. And what they're definitely not doing is A warming is causing B melting, which is causing C changes in the Earth's albedo, which D causes more warming, which causes more melting, which causes more warming, which causes more melting in the runaway spiral feedback effect. And yet, that's one of the things that we're most worried about as scientists. Okay. So unfortunately, this particular uh, association isn't fleshed out into that full multi-stage kind of a causal model. 
Then we get a lot of people who think of just rising temperatures. Then many people, and I won't talk about this, though somebody, if they want, can ask me about this in the Q&A, because it's a great story. Uh, many, many people continue to think that the ozone hole and the climate change are the same thing, or that the ozone hole causes climate change. And that's because of a, of a mishing, mashing together of different mental models. Then we have people who have alarmist images of catastrophic impacts. I mean, often way worse than the scientific scenarios, like death of the planet type uh, associations with global warming. And then on we go down to our last category, not least category, is the naysayers, uh, who doubt climate change. And they have a variety of different reasons. If they just say it's not happening, or I don't think the science has been proven yet, or doubt based on their own personal experience. You know, it was a cold winter, so therefore it can't be happening. Uh, those who blame it on hype, newspaper hype, environmentalist hype, to last but not least those we lovingly call the conspiracy theorists who say it's a hoax, it's scientists making up data, it's the UN trying to take away American sovereignty, it's Al Gore and his friends trying to get rich, and many, many other variants of that. Okay, crucially what's not on this list has never been on this in all the years we've asked it. Nobody associates global warming with impacts on human health. At all. And that's actually, I think, one of the most important dimensions that in the end, as societies, that we actually care the most about. And yet people haven't connected that dot at all. So I think that's actually one of the other great opportunities we have to help people understand why this matters. OK, so this is where we were, if you note, back in 2003. Here's where we were as of 2010. So you might notice there's been a slight change, um, in a particular in this last category. A massive uh, shift towards naysayer images, and about half of those are hoax-related, conspiracy-related type imagery. So this is part of what was going on in this time period from 2008 to 2010. So why? What was going on here? Well, we'd argue that there was a bit of a perfect storm. There were a whole bunch of things happening at once. First of all, the economy, the economy, the economy. 2008 is when the housing bubble po uh, pops, when the financial crisis hits, when unemployment surges up over 10%, and unsurprisingly, it soars to the top of public priorities where it's dominated ever since. So one is climate, energy, lots of other issues, including crime, all drop in public priorities because in the end, uh, there's only so much you can worry about. But what's less understood is the decline in media coverage. There's been a dramatic decline in media coverage. Uh, our colleague Max Boykoff here at the University of Colorado tracks newspaper coverage, found that it has dropped by about two thirds. Uh, Max, uh, um, sorry, Bob Brule uh, tracks nightly network news coverage, CBS Evening News, NBC Nightly News, et cetera. That's dropped 90%. Now, this is important because most Americans do not know a climate scientist personally. In fact, when asked if they could identify a living scientist, most people cannot do it. The few people who do offer a response say Einstein or Darwin, if only they were still alive, but they're not. So it's not personal experience. And I hate to break it to you, they're not reading the peer-reviewed literature. They're also not reading the IPCC reports or the National Climate Assessment or any of the other products that come out of our community. Primarily, the only way they know about this issue is through what they learn about it through the media, and then subsequent friendship and family networks and so on. Um, so when the media doesn't report this issue, it's literally out of sight and out of mind. Not to say that people have completely forgotten, it's just not salient. So this is a real challenge, because that is the communication environment in which we live. Um, we also had some unusually cold weather. If you remember, it's hard to go back to these days, but uh, 2009 and 2010, and I always get these backwards, were Snowmageddon and Snowpocalypse. Um, you know, we're running out of superlative names for those. And we know that some people who don't follow the issue very closely, have not developed strong opinions about it, do change their, their views of this issue based on what they've recently experienced in the weather. If it's a hot day, yeah, that sounds like global warming. If it's a cold winter or a cold day, well, that makes me question it a bit. Um, don't need to say a whole lot here, but we do have to give credit where it's due. They've been pretty effective. 
And they got they really kicked it into overgear, uh, overdrive when the Waxman-Markey bill was going through Congress. It was no longer an abstract discussion. There was real policy uh, being considered by the U.S. Congress, uh, as well as Copenhagen. You know, uh, really, the intent was to pass a global treaty. So they worked very hard, and they're pretty good. Um, I sometimes like to say I think they're some of the, the world's best conservationists. Um, because they reuse and recycle the same arguments again and again and again. Uh, and some, in fact, some people are now calling these zombie theories. Um, you know, these ideas, it's the sun, uh, it's cosmic rays, uh, you know, et cetera, uh, that just keep coming back. It doesn't matter how often the climate science community bash them down and says, look, we've looked at all of this. It's not, that's not the cause. And yet, like zombies, they keep coming back. You know, they cannot be killed. Um, climate gate happened in that time period. Uh, we've published a couple of papers on this and shown that uh, at, at the national level in the United States, about 12% of Americans became less convinced that climate change is happening, um, and more importantly, lost trust in climate scientists as a result of this pseudo scandal. Um, now, importantly, however, that 12%, which is significant, was not evenly spread throughout American society. It was highly concentrated among a particular subset of American society, mostly Republican conservative men who watch Fox and Rush and listen to Rush Limbaugh. Okay. And when our colleagues have gone and done media analysis, what do they see is that yes, the CBS Evening News and the New York Times reported this story once or twice, but really the bulk of coverage was in those kinds of uh, media outlets which repeated it again and again and always with a very sinister interpretation. So you're seeing here the increasing fragmentation of our media landscape. It's not the Walter Cronkite days where everybody gathers around the television and sees the same basic news. That's the way it is, as he used to close. Um, now we are broken up into you know, thousands, millions of individual, uh, ever more fragmented uh, media environments where you get these echo chamber effects. Um, and then also very important is increasing political polarization. And this, there's been lots of documentation of this, is that it really starts in about 1997 when Congress starts thinking about the Kyoto Protocol and Democrats and Republicans who were not that far apart at that time become ever farther and farther and farther and farther apart until where we are today, where it has almost become a dogma, at least in the Republican Party, that you cannot believe in climate change. You certainly cannot utter the words climate change uh, without uh, being seen as somewhat of a traitor uh, to the Republican way of viewing things. This is a really big problem, and it's one of the major things that we need to work on. Okay, so why the rebound, though, since then? Well, first of all, the economy and unemployment are improving, so people have a little more uh, headspace to deal with this. Um, we have seen increasing media coverage over the past two years, and in part that's because we've just had two years of really incredible extreme weather. Uh, in this country. And you know, you all know this far better than I do, but 2011 was an all-time record year, followed only by 2012. And uh, you know, one of the standard talking points for many years, and I'll say this, is that Americans were connecting the dots between climate change and extreme weather before the scientific community started talking about it and before the media started talking about it. Now, you all know the standard talking point. You probably used it at one point or another. You can never say that any one event was caused by global warming or caused by climate change. And the media heard that and said, therefore, I, we're never going to talk about it. I don't know how many times I saw like Brian Williams reporting one of these disasters uh, a few years ago and asked the question, so does this have anything to do with broader patterns? And someone at the Weather Channel, as an example, would just go, whiff, you know, thou shall not utter the words climate change. I think that's shifted uh, over the past year or so. Uh, and increasingly, people are willing to talk about it, in particular because this question, was this single event caused by global warming, is actually a really bad question. And actually, I give Jerry great credit for pioneering uh, new metaphors, new analogies that we can use, like the steroids metaphor, of how we can talk about this in ways that people actually understand. And that's a great conversation. So what we're finding is that just as of a, a couple weeks ago, uh, we have about 58% of Americans who think that global warming is affecting weather in the United States. People are beginning to connect the dots. Now, if something happens once, it's happenstance. If it happens twice, it's a coincidence. If it happens three times, you're beginning to see a pattern. 
And if it happens four, five, six, seven, eight, 22 times, people are themselves seeing this pattern and beginning to say, huh, something's really weird going on with extreme weather. I wonder if this has something to do with climate change. Now, that doesn't automatically translate into suddenly thinking climate change is a high priority issue. It doesn't automatically translate into changes in behavior. It doesn't automatically translate into sudden a demand that we pass comprehensive climate legislation. It's not that simple. But it at least has got people's attention, which is incredibly hard to do in today's media environment. And I think that these events are teachable moments. In fact, many of you already know this, because when an event happens, people come to you and are asking you, so does this have something to do with climate change? You're an expert, tell me. You don't usually get that question. But I guess you, I would guess that you're probably getting it a lot more because of extreme weather events. These are teachable moments. And many Americans, either rightly or wrongly, are making these connections with even specific events. That 2012 was the warmest year on record, the ongoing drought in the Midwest, uh, many say that it had something to do with making Sur Superstorm Sandy more severe, as well as uh, the big snowstorm that hit us uh, in New England uh, just a few months ago. All right. Um, now, the other thing that we've learned in our research is that uh, while we talk about the public, there really is no such thing as the public, that Americans don't have a single voice on this issue or any important issue. And so what we wanted to do is try to break the public down into the key audiences, the key groupings within America that each have a different pers perspective on this. And what we've identified is what we call Global Warming Six Americas. Uh, let me introduce you to them. Um, first is a group we call the Alarmed. This is about 16% of the public. These are people who think it's happening, it's human caused, uh, it's a serious and urgent problem. Uh, many of them are highly supportive of action, but they really actually don't know what we can do. They don't know what they can do individually, and they don't know what we can do collectively to address this problem. And that's a real failure of the, com of the com climate community. We've done a far better job explaining what the problem is and what the impacts are than we have of what uh, the potential solutions are. Next is a group we call the Concerned, about 26%. These are people who think it's happening, human cause, serious, but again, they tend to think it's distant. Distant in time, distant in space. So again, a lower priority, stuck on the back burner. Then a group we call the Cautious, about a quarter of the public. Uh, these are fence-sitters, uh, not really sure. Is it happening, is it not? Is it human, is it natural? Is it serious, or is it kind of overblown? Uh, paying attention, but haven't really made up their mind. Then a very interesting group we call the Disengaged, have heard of global warming, but know nothing about it. I don't know what the causes are. I don't know what the impacts are going to be. I don't know anything about the solutions. For them, basic awareness is the primary barrier. Then a group we call the doubtful, and these are people who say, you know, I don't really pay much attention to it, but I don't think it's happening. And if it is, it's natural. It's nothing we had anything to do with, nothing we can do anything about. Uh, I think it's all kind of you know, but a little bit liberal uh, discussion. So they don't pay much attention to it, but their predisposition is to say it's not a serious risk. And then last but not least are the group we call the dismissive. Uh, and these are the people who are firmly convinced it's not happening, not human cause, not a serious problem. And again, uh, many of them are conspiracy theorists. Now note, there are only 13%. Let me say that again. There are only 13%. But they're a really loud 13%. They're a really vocal 13%. They're a relatively organized 13%. They're a 13% that's particularly well uh, represented in the halls of Congress. They've had an outsized influence on public discourse and debate. And in fact, our colleagues have done things like code uh, the comment section in uh, newspaper articles and say, USA Today. You've all seen this. You go, we read an article about climate change uh, online, and you'll look at the comment section. And 50, 60, 70 percent of those comments can often be from this perspective. So it's easy to come away as a member of the public, as a journalist, as a policymaker, with the impression that it's half or more of the country. But it's not. It's 13 percent. All right, lots of things that, can, that come out of that, these insights of who these different groups are. But just as a quickly way to get on it, when we ask Americans, if you could ask an expert on global warming one question, 
what question would you ask? You see that there are three completely different conversations happening in this country at the same time. Down here, the doubtful and dismissive, they want to know, so how do you know that global warming is happening or human cause? And on a deeper level, they're saying, and why should I trust you? Meanwhile, these groups in the middle are saying things like, OK, maybe it's happening, but so what? Why should I care? Whereas the groups down here, the alarmed and the concerned, are saying, OK, I'm with you. It's happening. It's human cause. It's serious. But what do we do about it? What are the solutions? And what we're beginning to hear in their responses is, is it too late? And that's a really dangerous idea to have spread. I mean, just to quickly encapsulate it with one of my favorite quotes from Henry Ford, those who think they can and those who think they can't are both right. If you get fatalistic about this issue, we will not, uh, we will not solve it. OK, so to summarize, um, as I mentioned before, we saw this big decline in public understanding of the issue that completely changed the national political climate, uh, that there are these six different Americas. They all need tailored engagement strategies. Importantly, importantly, that the facts are always being actively interpreted by these different audiences. They are not empty vessels just waiting to be told what to believe by journalists or the climate scientists or whomever. They come preloaded with, if you want to use the metaphor, software and, and you know, an operating system that already predisposes them to interpret new information in particular ways. You need to know what, that, what operating system they're running as well as what software they're using. Okay? Terrible metaphor, but I used it anyway. Um, Knowledge is necessary. It is necessary. I'm, I want to push back against those who have been flogging this horse about the information deficit model for years. And I've contributed to that. It is not just simply about providing more and more information. That's true. But let's not take that pendulum too far in the opposite direction and say that therefore information doesn't matter and that knowledge doesn't matter. That's not true either. It's necessary, but it's insufficient. There's always also in that decision-making, judgment decision of all of us, because we're human beings, emotions, values, ideology, and all these broader social, political, and economic forces all coming together to help us shape our interpretations of these issues. Um, and then in terms of forward strategies, of course, it obviously depends a lot on which audience you're talking about. But I think overall, it's really important that we do continue to convey this basic idea that many people still don't understand, that the experts agree. If 9 out of 10 dentists tell you that Crest is good for you and that actually works, then why isn't 9 out of 10 of the people who spend their lives studying climate science, uh, their entire career studying this, and have all reached the same basic agreement that it's happening in human cause and it's going to have serious impacts, why can't we convey that? Um, the human consequences, the human consequences, the human consequences. This is not an environmental problem. People have this compartment in their heads in which they file environmental problems, represented by things like glaciers and polar bears. Okay, Fabulous for those people who love glaciers and polar bears. But that's not most Americans. What we have to help people understand, and it's actually one of the great advantages of climate change as a problem, is that it is not just an environmental problem. It's a health problem. It's a national security problem. It's an economics problem. It's a health problem. All of those, it's a moral and religious problem. All of those are just as legitimate, in fact, really important dimensions of this issue that need to be engaged as well. Um, again, the links to extreme weather, these are those opportunities to at least start the conversation. And then last but not least, that the problem is solvable, that there is, in fact, hope. Uh, with that, thank you, and look forward to our conversation. Um, and I certainly want to save time for the panelists to make their comments and to have some very active question and answer. So I'm actually going to skip kind of the formal introductions that I made for the three panelists and go ahead and invite them up. Um, I will just very briefly say that all three in their own right, Jerry, Mark, 
Joni, come on up, are experts in the field of climate science, but not only experts, they're very passionate and experienced communicators. And so they're coming up on stage to share their reflections on uh, Tony's presentation, as well as perhaps some of their own insights from their own experiences. Just trying to have a little bit of fun, I will only introduce Mark as someone who does care deeply about glaciers and polar bears. <laughs> Joni is someone who cares deeply about coral reefs and marine ecosystems. And as you've already heard, Jerry cares deeply about baseball and steroids. <laughs> so uh, with that, uh, I would like to, uh, in, oh, yes, can we? Yeah, when we do, we'll, we'll turn off the projector. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, again remind each one of the panelists, we'll, we'll take, oh, let's say four or five minutes uh, for you to uh, present your thoughts on the presentation or perhaps share some of your own perspectives related to today's topic from your own experiences in trying to communicate climate science. Since Jerry has the microphone, I, I will go ahead and, and start with you, Jerry. Well, uh, thanks for that. Um, well, first of all, it was a great presentation. Um, and I was actually encouraged that uh, there's that far right category is only 13 percent, um, and there's actually in the 20s on the left side. Uh, and I was thinking it was going to be worse than that, uh, because I think for all of us, or a lot of us, that try to communicate this this kind of uh, issue, what we run up against in this country, especially, is the political polarization on this issue. I run into this all the time. So when I'm talking to my relatives, who are from Eastern Colorado, who are Republicans. They think that the Republican line on this is it's a hoax, and uh, it's not happening, and uh, we don't need to worry about it. And I can talk till I'm blue in the face, and they're, they just that's it. It's that's the Republican say, and that's it. So, and you can talk to Democrats on the other side who are on that very kind of impassioned, hysterical side. So it's like this issue just since the time that probably all of us have been working on this, it's gotten, and you noted this too, it's gotten worse and worse. And people say, well, what's going to change that? And I said, well, how many election cycles is it going to take to get back to more moderate government? And I don't know the answer to that. Because what you want is moderates to view this issue. You don't want people who are on the extremes. You want people who are in that middle area who are kind of thinking, okay, well, give me some information. You know, what, what, are, what is happening? You know, they're open to hearing information rather than just shutting it off immediately as a political issue. And I think from, from the science point of view, that's the most frustrating thing. To us, it's a science issue. It's a very interesting science problem, very compelling science problem. Uh, and uh, it, when you start hitting people who you treat it as a political problem, that's really frustrating. The other thing I wanted to say was, um, just coincidentally, just minutes before I came down here, I was on the phone with a reporter from USA Today. She's doing a, a she's involved with a, a series of articles that they've been doing on various aspects of climate variability and climate change. She wrote the piece that maybe some of you heard reported on on the um, uh, increasing allergy season. And uh, I said, well, how how is this being received? How is this series being received? And she says, well, the environmentalists love it. And she goes, of course, then we get the usual pushback from the uh, you know the political right. But her approach, and I think this is a valid approach, and you mentioned this, is uh, to communicate this in terms of uh, how it impacts people. Okay, the hay fever season. A lot of people have hay fever. Longer hay fever season because it's warmer. It's connected to climate change. People get that. Uh, extremes is another common one, even though, you know, with all the issues of trying to say, well, we can't attribute an individual event, but extremes affect people. They know people are affected. They see it. It's a very visual, dramatic kind of a thing. Uh, and the, I think the challenge for those of us who try to communicate this, and what I was, I was violating all your rules in talking to this reporter, because what I was, she wanted to know about the Texas drought. She's going to Texas later this week, and she wants to, she wants to talk to rice farmers, other farmers, water managers, uh, and get their, how the drought has affected them, and what they think about it. And she goes, asked the usual question, well, is the drought caused by climate change? And I said, well, there's always more than one thing going on in the climate system. And then try to explain things like the effects of the La Nina event that we know produces dry conditions in the southwest US. Tried to ex explain this kind of more obscure thing, which I kind of, uh, with some trepidation, kind of went into this. Tried to explain these kind of lower, uh, longer timescale fluctuations, what we call decadal climate variability. 
internally generated natural fluctuations in the system that happen over periods of tens of years that we know affect climate in the southwest U.S. And of course, then long-term climate change that we know will dry out the southwest U.S. And, try, and so she actually came up with the word, and she was, oh, so we're looking at this through three different lenses. I said, great analogy. So that's a really good way to put that. So when you, when you deal with a reporter who's receptive and interested and, and really is trying to do a good job, I think it's really encouraging. But it's still for her, I think. And she said her editor, they got a new editor, and it was his idea to do this series. And he thought it was, it was the time to do this because of all the extreme weather in the last two years have been uh, you know, really interesting for people. But I think you know, that, that's, that's encouraging. So I think there is hope in terms of communication, but I think the barrier we still face is this real political polarization, at least in this country. Those are all good comments, and I, I have to say it was a great presentation. It it covered, you know, I've, I'm coming at this as a person that's learned by trial and error, more error than anything, but uh, but it really does echo my experience with trying to communicate with the public, and I agree a lot with what you're talking about with reporters. Some of the do's and don'ts are, are very uh, important to know. I think one of the things that sort of echoed with me in your presentation is everybody thinks differently. And one of the first things to do, I mean, this is, goes against us as scientists, and it, it actually does hurt our reputation, is to, is to listen before you speak. So I mean, I use this practice on um, planes a lot. You're sitting there with your new, neck, you know, your new best friend right there. And you want to, you know, invariably, you're going to be working on some PowerPoint presentation that you've got to give <laughs> within a few hours. And so they always say, what do you work on? Of course, I'm working on reefs, so I got pretty things up there. So they usually ask me that. And so I'll give them just, just tell them what I'm working on. And they, you know, you want to get them to the point where they're asking you questions. So the way to do that is you ask them questions. What do you know? Right? So we're getting to the point where, where do you put them? Are they on one end of the extreme or the other? And through experience and through some of the things that you've said, you can, you can identify who they are and you can speak to them accordingly and ask them the right questions. That, so I'm speaking to you as individuals giving a message, not as a person standing up in front of Congress, whatever, although it works in front of Congress as well. So, you know, uh, I can remember once giving testimony to Congress and I'm talking about the issue of ocean acidification in coral reefs and, you know, also climate change in coral reefs. And you can just see the one side of the, you know, the committee is Republican, the other side is. They've got the one side of Republicans just sort of sitting there as you're talking about these things. And then when you look at, you know, I remember just coming in my mind, I'm not getting to these guys. That's one thing. You just got to keep observing. And I'm like, so what I'm saying is, you know, and I look straight at them, is that we're messing around with God's masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I knew at the moment that little scientist on my shoulder was saying, you can't say that. <laughs> But I said it, and I can tell you, a couple of those guys just sat up in their seats like this. It's really hit what was important to them. So we have to be willing to talk on their terms, think about what they do, and, and what's important to them. I also think something that we scientists do is we, we do need to establish our credibility. That's the second point of, of being good spokespersons. But you need to tone that down. You do just enough to establish your credibility, but don't be ivory tower. Again, be a human. Be a human, be passionate, show your passion, it's OK. And that was a hard lesson for me to learn. But I can tell you, it's one of the most effective ways of communicating. If I were a really sexy person, I would use that, because apparently that's the best way to get to people. <laughs> but you have, to, you have to go here. And then um, I think the other thing is, is don't blame people. So, I can remember another one. I'll just give you another uh, example. I was at a coral reef conference, and I walked into the hotel. I was putting together a video for the conference, and the concierge comes up to me, and he says, I, I can't believe all you people talking about climate change. I don't believe it. So I just started asking him questions. Well, I said, thank you for even asking the question. Thank you for being engaged. You know, And, and I, I continued to compliment him for being engaged, asking what his sources of information were. 
Then I apologized. I said, well, we scientists are failing you because we're not very good communicators. We're not com com you know, competing with some of the other people out there. And I, you know, the more questions I asked him, the more he asked me. And by the end, he was helping us with our video. And he was in the video. So there are ways to get to people individually. And they're going to go back and talk to other people. And that's what we should get. So I'll shut up now. But that's my experience. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. I, I think a, a lot of you know, what I heard in the talk was, was, was spot on, was spot on from our experiences. Uh, so I'm uh, Mark Therese, I'm the director of the National Snow and Ice Data Center, which is just down the hill here, we're part of the University of Colorado. And we're the, deal, we're the people who deal with the data on snow and ice, melting glaciers, <laughs> melting sea ice, that's us, okay? A lot of that information comes from us. So I think in many ways, in issues of science communication, we are very much on the front lines of this. Uh, so we experience this almost on a daily basis. So I think what I'd like to relate is just a few of the lessons that we've learned uh, as we've, we've, we've tried to be better communicators of science. And the first lesson that we've learned is that you can make the information both scientifically accurate and accessible. That's hard to do. But it can be done, and it must be done. Um, we have various venues of getting information out. One of them is called our Arctic Sea Ice News and Analysis, where it's a day-by-day -day account of what's happening to the sea ice, periodic discussion pieces. We've learned how to do it, how to avoid. You avoid, for example, silly or words that don't work, like temperature anomalies. An anomaly, oh, that doesn't work. We can't talk about temperature advection or something like that, statistical significance. These things don't work, okay? Uh, you end up sounding like you're in your ivory tower, okay, on the one hand. They don't get through, okay? You can do it if you try. And, and when we try to write our pieces, for example, on our CI students, we've got several scientists vetting that with our communications people, okay, to make sure that it's finding that right balance, okay? So I think that's one of the most important lessons we've learned, okay, is that, you know, accuracy versus accessibility. Second, Always be aware of this broad gray line between information and advocacy. We pride ourselves on trying to be honest brokers of data and information. Okay, here's the data, here's our interpretation of what we're seeing. As unbiased as we can. Okay? Why do we think this is happening? How does this compare with other years? Those sorts of things. We, we really try to be those honest purveyors of that information. But very often, we are approached by groups like Greenpeace okay, or Sierra Club, okay, wanting us to become part of them or so that they can uh, cite us as you know, supporting their cause and things like that. We have learned to be very careful of how we approach these things because they can easily backfire. Okay? When we look at the climate change debate on what's happening, we see that the shrill arguments on the left the sky is falling, it's all gloom and doom, are as unhelpful as the shrill arguments on the right. Okay? They're equally unhelpful. Okay? So, you know, we've got to be careful in how we approach this. Okay? We're going to get that information out, but, you know, if we find ourselves being affiliated in some way with, say, an extreme on either side, okay, we lose our credibility. We see our credibility as being those on that honest brokers of data information. So you have to be careful. Third one, pick your battles. You've always got to be able to pick your battles. Now, uh, we actually have someone who periodically trolls the blogosphere to see how our name is being used in the debate. And uh, you know, there's a lot of things that come up where people are just talking about us, and that's fine. We let it go. But sometimes we will find that our name is being dragged through the mud for some reason or another, either deliberately or through mistake or through uh, miscommunication. And we will sometimes uh, respond to these. Uh, a couple cases, for example, where there was a piece written on some blogosphere that was suddenly published on Fox on New, uh, online, okay? verbatim almost, and erroneously attributing a statement to us, which we never said. We actually got a retraction on that. There's been a several occasions where we've done this. We fight our battles. On the one hand, if you're dealing with the blogosphere, of course, having a retraction almost doesn't matter. You know, the damage is done. Okay. You know, everyone sees that first post. They don't see the retraction. But uh, you know, we, we do learn we have to fight our battles. We've only got limited resources to do this. Fourth, 
learn from your mistakes. And we all make mistakes. And sometimes we do things in trying to be good communicators of science, trying to get that information out that backfire. Okay? You have to simply learn from them. Case in point, a few years ago, we were approached by the History Channel. And they wanted to do some, we thought, right, uh, some kind of show on global warming and things like that. And so I went on my college, agreed uh, to be interviewed as part of this. And we thought the interview was going a little bit weird, okay, but we weren't quite sure what was happening. We were saying, OK, they've got uh, our best interest in mind. Uh, no, no. We find out the show is produced, and uh, it's part of Armageddon Week on the History Channel, right? <laughs> So we see this show, there I am as a talking head, Nostradamus makes his appearance, right? <laughs> and so you can see, you know, their agenda was not our agenda. You have to be careful with dealing with the media often, okay? Because they may not be interested in your story. They are often only interested in their story. That's not to say that there's not a lot of good journalists out there. There are, okay? But you have to learn from your mistakes and you have to go into these things eyes wide open. Thank you. I get to hand the mic around, I guess. <laughs> so um, while we, while you guys think of a question, I'm going to take a prerogative to ask a quick one. So on that, the six Americas, and remember the three questions, the, the people who really care about it, they want to know what they can do. The middle folks, who maybe we have hope with, want to know what the impacts are, why they should care. And then that last part is, why should I believe you? You know, as scientists, it strikes me that that middle section of talking about impacts is very safe. You can have, could be, have completely safe in your integrity and focus there. And Antonio's wondering, we talked about this a little last night, where should we spend their time? It strikes me that that moving the disengaged and those cautious over is probably way easier than dealing with the dismissive. So talking about impacts seems like something that would be everyone would be comfortable with. But just curious what you, what you think about that, if it's worth folks' time to do it that way. Thank you. Uh, so this connects to what you were saying as well. Um, I think we have we have these cultural dynamics in science. Okay, uh, in our culture, if somebody questions your conclusions, what's your natural reaction? Is to say, well, then let me give you more evidence. Here's another dozen papers that have all reached the same conclusion as I have. But when you're having a discussion with someone who's a conspiracy theorist, all you're doing is putting more wood on the fire because you're saying, look how big the conspiracy is. <laughs> and yet we get sucked into those. And so what I would suggest is that we need, as scientists, to sometimes change our frame of reference. We're not involved in a scientific conference where you get to actually have this engaged debate with your colleagues. who you They may be dense, and you may be, have to beat them over the head with the evidence. But in the end, it's about the evidence. Um, instead, we should see this more along the model of a jury trial. Your job, if you are the mem if you're the defense attorney, is not to convince the prosecutor that your argument is right. That's not your job. Your job is to convince the people who are sitting in the jury box that your argument makes more sense. And I think as scientists, we often sometimes lose sight of that. That really our audience is those middle groups that are actually interested to know what we what we uh, have to say, see us as credible, honest brokers, and are trying to understand this themselves. And that's really where we've got the greatest opportunity. How about over here? Thanks. Um, one of the questions I had is, is this really a role for the scientists to take? When we were forming the climate service, attempting to form the climate service in NOAA, uh, one of the qu questions I had is, are we the ones that are really responsible for communicating to the public, getting out there? Because it puts the climate community in a really unique position in that you don't have health scientists out there saying, you know, this new virus is extremely dangerous. They publish the papers. Maybe the media takes the message forward. Is there a missing role between the scientists that a lot of what you were hinting at is you can't go too far because you lose your impartiality. You become an advocate. You become a, a proponent of a cause that's opposite someone else's beliefs, should there be a role between the scientist and the community that is taking the information that lets us remain dispassionate and scientific? 
Well, yeah, there's maybe two aspects to that question. One is science communication. The other is providing climate information. So the climate service, um, I think one of the ideas that other countries have had for climate services uh, where they don't have the political issues we have uh, is you have a kind of an interface group who are, where we have, uh, who are knowledgeable from the science but that are good at understanding what the users need in terms of information. So in a climate service context, that's one really key kind of group of people who are kind of interface people between the scientists and the, uh, and the stakeholders. In terms of communication, that's, that's also a helpful group, but a little bit more difficult to identify, I think, because um, you know, those of us who end up doing you know, media kind of things, you know, we, we have real jobs and we you know, get paid to write papers and do science. We don't really get paid to do communication. So what we do uh, in this regard is we're doing because we like to do it or we think it's important. Um, so, you know, you have the situation where, you know, most scientists don't want to talk to the media. They're not good at it. They wouldn't be good at it no matter what you did. Um, and that's, that's fine. So that means it falls on kind of a small group of people. We always try to get, you know, younger scientists in car interested in trying to talk to the media if possible so we kind of spread the load out a little bit. And that's, that's really useful too because I think if the media hears from younger scientists, that helps. Um, and for their audience, you know, if you see a, a person in their 20s talking authoritatively about climate change, that demographic, that appeals to the people who are watching that. So that's another aspect of this. But I think this is an issue that we haven't really solved yet, um, is how we actually, as scientists, as a community, how we, how we deal with this. Can I just add briefly to that, just from maybe a little bit of a different slant on that. You know, my view on this is that the role of the scientist has evolved, and it must evolve. Uh, you know, it was none, wasn't that long ago that, uh, uh, you know, we at the National Snow and Ice Data, for example, are scientists studying snow and ice. Oh, that's interesting, kind of boring, okay? But around the turn of the century, right, it all started to change, right? We saw all this change occurring. We've got to grow a new brain all of a sudden. And we don't have a choice, right? So I see that the role of the scientist itself must continue to evolve. And, uh, uh, and I think that's you know, a big part of the solution. As, as Jerry said, you know, this is not really part of our real job, right? We're paid to write papers and things like that. Uh, but, but we are forced to grow this new brain now. And so what we really need to do, in my opinion, is to have the issue of you know, science communication much more in the forefront of the scientist training itself right at the outset. Okay? Because the, I think the, the days of sitting in your ivory tower just doing your thing are, are waning fast. May I add just a little bit to that? So uh, I, I agree our roles are changing, and particularly the roles as the younger people come up through the ranks. They're much more concerned about making a difference in the, the, in the science and much more willing to be good communicators. And so we need to support that. But I think all scientists have a role to play. If you really do think that climate change is an issue, you at least need to be, need to be supportive of those that are trying to communicate um, to also educate yourself on why perhaps we're using metaphors that they don't like. Uh, you know, be a, educate yourself enough to understand why people are communicating in the ways they are. It's always great to have good feedback from scientists to keep us honest and on track, but there's definitely a science to communication, just like there's a science to everything else. Well, I'll, I'll limit my remarks to this, I guess. Um, so first of all, I think uh, Mark is exactly right. The role of the scientist is evolving, and evolving very quickly. And that's happening in a broader media environment where it used to be that only a few people would talk to the media because the media was the media. It was the medium by which people learned about the science. And what we're seeing is that there's a wholesale historic transformation in the traditional news media. Whole newspapers are going out of business. As their business models get squeezed ever finer, what are often the first desks to get chopped are the science and environment desks. And we're losing reporters who have years of experience, which you've got to have to report this issue well. This is not a simple issue, as we all know. And when you lose somebody like an Andy Revkin from the New York Times, you're losing decades worth of, of knowledge. I mean, he actually knows as much or more about this issue than many scientists. Um, so that's all happening, and that's troubling. 
But at the same time, we're seeing this explosion in the ability of scientists to directly communicate with the public through the internet, through social media, through blogs, through websites. And many scientists are now taking advantage of that. And so I think we need to start thinking outside the traditional box and recognize that there are all kinds of new ways that we can engage with the public uh, and help them understand these issues. Not just through the media, but again, through social media, through science museums, zoos and aquariums, natural history museums, the, the traditional classroom, and so on and so on. I just wanted to, um, it, it, this was a perfect segue to my question, which is to take it to a higher level and unpack your trusted messenger piece a little bit more. Um, there's a little bit of uh, evidence out there. I, I believe it's 13% of Americans follow science day to day. 67% follow sports, for example. And, and Jerry has got you know, his wonderful sports analogy. And uh, you talked, Tony, uh, about the litter and smoking thing. Uh, a colleague of mine was tasked uh, with solving the litter issue in South Carolina, and she did it through NASCAR drivers, the, the trusted messenger. So I'd love to have you guys talk about how the scientific community in this room can start to influence other trusted messengers to make them smarter. So who are they, and then what, what tools can you guys use to better educate them? <laughs> I don't even trust trust the, the you know the snow and ice guy in a tropical shirt. How can he be trusted? So right? we're still looking for our next Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think you're exactly right. Finding finding representatives that are good trusted messengers, but the metaphors too become their own message. Without you know that many people can use. So the steroids analogy, the smoking analogy, all of those things are very useful. Um, we, sometimes you try to engage famous people. Uh, I mean, I think the last, there was a study showing that the Kardashians get 95% uh, more coverage than, uh, than ocean acidification would ever think of getting. <laughs> so, I mean, if we, could, if we could get the Kardashians to talk about ocean acidification, we'd solve both problems. Well, yeah, in terms of trusted messengers, you know, my first reaction might be perhaps our elected officials, but then I realized that might not work so well. But uh, at least, <laughs> but who are they in, in this in this space? It's it's hard to say. I would like to say, you know, that the scientists themselves are the trusted messengers, but that um, has been eroded. Uh, that has been eroded. I don't think through the. Uh, fault of the scientists themselves necessarily. Well, maybe part. I mean, if you think about climate gate, right? There were some, you know, dumb things done there. Okay, that eroded that trust. Okay, but um, as as you know, you know, the erosion of of trust in the scientists. Okay, has also come from these rather well organized uh, groups. You know, that are trying to see that misinformation to to simply uh, uh, get it across. You know, try to uh, set that, that idea in there that the scientists don't have an agreement there. So uh, um, I think the scientists can and should be trusted messengers on this, but uh, you know, we, um, we've got uh, our own adversaries to be dealing with at the same time. Okay, I, I think that uh, one of the things that we came to realize through ocean acidification research is something that we learned from uh, Katrina and who were the trusted messengers there in terms of who got out of town and not. And so one of the things we've talked about in my circles is targeting religious leaders, people that are respected in the, in the community on, on other avenues. It doesn't have to be a famous personality. It has to be somebody that people trust. They could be very quiet, we don't know about them, but trying to find those people and talk to them and have them be messengers is a very powerful way of doing it, but I don't think we've done it as a scientific community very well yet. I think that's really a great question and a great avenue for us to tackle. Where, where's Joe DiMaggio? <laughs> okay, so this is a great question, um, uh, but let me just clarify something you were saying because it's really important. We ask who do people trust on this? Who is credible? And climate scientists by far are the most trusted voices in America on this issue. The problem is, again, nobody knows a climate scientist. 
And climate scientists have day jobs. And as you said, most of them aren't trained in this. They aren't very good at it. I sometimes joke that 75% of them ought to have a restraining order keeping them away from microphones or uh, video cameras. And some of my friends in the community say, actually, it's more like 90%, um, which is fine. That's not why you went into this job, right? But that said, back to what you were saying before, let's not punish those that do, because you need them. You desperately need them. You desperately need them. And for those that are willing to actually communicate this issue, they need to be the ambassadors of this entire field. Um, but beyond that, to underscore your point, it's about empowering other opinion leaders. There is a long literature here about how to affect, for instance, uh, change in terms of public health. Okay? You don't do it through advertisements. You don't do it through doctors sitting there giving you a long lecture and so on. You find opinion leaders, those people embedded in communities that have long-term relationships of trust who can carry that message for you. So just as one example, engaging the public health community, engaging the agricultural extension service, these are people who are embedded in farming communities all across America. They've been there for decades. They have the trusted relationships. How can climate scientists work with those guys and women to actually empower them to carry this message and help their constituents understand this issue better? That's the challenge, I think, is much more than us directly communicating, is helping those other opinion leaders. Uh, you mentioned earlier what you call, I think it's a gateway issue or something, and that is whether people believe that scientists are in agreement or not. And, you know, last time I talked to my neighbor on this, one of the neighbors, they said 3% of scientists agree. That was the number they used. So I've heard the number 97%, but what source can I quote on that so I don't say, I have a scientific paper that says 97%, you know, and they're going to go, well, that's a scientific paper. I mean, is there some independent source that most people would believe that you could point them to or use and say this shows that there's general agreement? So there have been a whole series of studies that have examined this using different methodologies and I think perhaps the most powerful is the ones that have looked at uh, the peer-reviewed literature. What's actually published? How many, what proportion of papers actually question uh, that it's happening or that it's uh, considered uh, human contributions. And so actually just last week there was the latest version of Naomi Oreskes did the original version well now over a decade ago. Uh, John Cook and colleagues just did this as well. Uh, they've actually got a website called the Consensus Project where they have that. There have been surveys of scientists that have all basically ended up in the same uh, basic area of 95 to 97 um, percent. But let me take the question and actually say one broader thing. Um, and that's again about the power of individual words and language. Um, I think as a community, we didn't, I don't think we ever had a meeting where we all discussed this. I know we didn't. But we've used this word consensus. And I think it's actually caused more problem than it's been worth. Because there's always this argument about, is there a consensus? So the scientific community says, yes, there's a consensus that climate change is happening in human cause. And the other side says, no, there isn't. Look, here's five scientists over here, and look, I've got a long list of 18,000 scientists who all say it's not happening. Okay, so there's no consensus. Um, turns out, when you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, there are two dictionary definitions of consensus. The first dictionary definition is widespread agreement, and that's the sense in which our community uses it. There's overwhelming agreement among the experts that, yes, these things are true. But the second dictionary definition is unanimity. And that's the definition that the opponents are using. And they're right. There isn't absolute 100% unanimity about these things. You can always find somebody who's willing to buck that with a PhD uh, after their name. So I think we've actually gotten into, we, I mean, Aristotle beautifully once said, it's amazing how many uh, arguments could be deflated to a single paragraph if only the disputants had bothered to define their terms. And I think we've lost an awful lot of of argumentation over what does consensus mean without ever really addressing that. Thank you. Um, on the trusted messenger question, so no one's mentioned Jim Hansen yet, so I would just want to throw it out there. Has he been a good ambassador, or do you think he went too far out on a limb and actually was a disservice to conveying the message? Um, you 
could ask the same question about Al Gore. Um, not a scientist. I mean, as a scientist. Yeah. No, I think I think Jim has has done a lot of really good things in terms of trying to communicate. Um, the thing about Jim is, um, if if you actually see him speak, uh, you're thinking this is the last guy that is, should be talking to the media. He's very quiet, very soft spoken, but that works to his advantage, I think, because you look at him, you think this guy's not trying to beat me over the head with something. He's just giving me some information. So I think that's one of the real strong things about Jim that I've noticed about about him over the years. And he's and he's kept it up, and he's kept it up in a in a visible way. Um, you know, in the late '80s, his the dice analogy and and all these things. You know, that, I think that that's that's been really good. Of course, he's just now retired about two months ago to go full time into advocacy because he realized that um, as scientists, we're always on this teetering on the brink of, you know, we're trying to give information, and we're not trying to look at like we're advocates in terms of some political action. And he said, okay, well, that's it. I'm, I'm now to the point where I'm going to try to advocate political action. So he retired from NASA to do that. So I think that was a decision he made to, to go over to the other side. But I think this is something we have problems with all the time, because people want to say, well, what, what do I do about this? And, you know, politically, I always say, pay attention to who you vote for not telling him who to vote for. I said, pay attention to who you vote for. Listen to what your candidates are saying about this issue. That's important. Your vote is important. That's something you, everybody can do. But beyond that, then we have to kind of always keep falling back on the science. On that trusted messenger piece, just to add to that, you know, I, I stress from my own perspective that um, alarmism doesn't help. It's not helpful. Uh, you know, the, the real shrill, we're all going to die, the sky is going to fall, okay, doesn't help us. And the problem you find, I find often, is those that have, say, movie stars or whatnot who have taken up the cause, okay, in an effort to help, often end up hurting more than they help because they don't have that training in the science, okay, and so they pick up maybe these snippets, uh, and, and they, they often have this tendency to be a little overboard, okay, and that is not always helpful. The other thing no one's talked about is you really have to tailor your message to who you're talking to. He might be great for somebody and someone else is going to completely shut down. Um, so you have to do a little due diligence about who you're talking to. Certainly with reporters, you ask them what your story is about because <laughs> they have a goal. Then you need to figure out how you can work your way into their goal. But And no one's mentioned the United States military. For those folks on that right end of the scale, really great, strong messenger, and they are totally with you. So that's just another one. So go ahead, gentlemen. And then if you could just pass the mic to the woman in the blue in front of you when you're done, and then we'll go over to the other side. Yes, I have a question and then um, a brief comment of my own experience of dealing with it. So um, I have a, a multi multiplicity of backgrounds, one of which is I used to be an economist and I've taught environmental economics and um, also environmental ethics in university settings. And in that context, if you think about uh, what they call discounting and how we view the value of the future in relation to the present, and with a very little bit of simple math, which I actually in public talks take people through, because of where you get to at the end, you can show them very quickly that we don't really think the ce a century from now is worth very much. And a thousand years from now is worth essentially nothing, thinking from an ice kind of standpoint. But one of the things that, that you can do with that, and I've been able to do with this in some of my graduate classes and actually in public speaking at churches and other places where I've sp spoken, say, okay, a century from now, if we say the reality of, of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren is worth less than 1% to us of what our reality is worth now, do you really want to say that to your grandchildren? That gets them. And all of a sudden, they're able to think long-term in a way that maybe they haven't been before. And that connects up with what you were saying, Tony, about connecting with values, with church groups in particular. I found that, that openness to values language is very strong. And uh, so I was wondering if, if, if you've thought about this in the sense of one of the components of the problem is how do you bring the future into the present? How do you make them sit at the table like um, uh, Robert Solo, the economist, said in his famous 1974 piece? So I'd like to hear what the panel has to say about that. Thanks. Well, 
Well, I mean, I think uh, it, it is a really tough question in terms of this. Um, on the other hand, I think it's increasingly you're capable of connecting it to the here and now and to people's actual lives. So let, let me just, I mean, I think what you just mentioned is, is a perfect example. Um, I have a 10 year old son. He's going to be my age in 2050. He's going to be just like me in the year 2050. Probably better than me, actually. Um, so, you know, that means I have a very real stake uh, in what's coming. And, you know, he doesn't have children yet. So, and yet that still already gets us to the 2050 line. And moreover, I want to be here in 2050. I can't wait to see how this all unfolds. I mean, it, there's going to be such incredible things that are going to happen in the next 40 years, as well as horrible things that are going to happen in the next 40 years. I, I want to be here. So, um, you know, that's already a time frame that actually does make sense that we can think about and so on. Um, uh, but it's hard because we as a culture are not the Iroquois, right? We don't just automatically say, what's seven generations out? What are the implications of this? We, you know, we talk about it sometimes in the environmental community, but it's very hard for most of us to put our, ourselves in that, in those moccasins, so to speak. So I think it's a great question. I don't think any of us have the full answer yet of helping people understand. But I, I would say this, that it's, and this is actually one of the places where I think the scientific community can help a tremendous amount and that's help us visualize it. How can you make this abstract distant future seem real? Right here, right now. Through your visualization lab, as an example. Through those abilities. I mean, not just to be able, and I, let me just say this on, uh, from a perceptual standpoint. When we show people maps of how uh, sea levels are going to increase in the future, what is the position that you're always in when you see that? It's always God's eye view looking down, right? It's always looking down and seeing, oh, this amount of New York City or this amount of the coastline is going to be covered with water. Okay, not fine, but I'm not God. I don't live up there. I live here. Give me a view instead of New York City and my neighborhood where I can now see here's where the sea level rise is going to be. I think we have tools now coming into our hands things like Google Glass, that are going to revolutionize our ability to imagine what the future is going to hold. And I would just throw that out there as a challenge to those of you who think in these terms. How can you convey these abstractions in those visual ways, but even better to do it through stories? That is the most powerful form of communication human beings have ever invented, is stories, not data. The only reason why we get excited about data is because it tells us a story. Right? We've been we've been trained in the secret language of statistics to actually say, "Oh my god, look at the story here." Right? It's the story that you got to tell. And stories can allow us to actually walk in the moccasins of another person to try to actually understand what is this going to mean for their lives. I think broadly, this is something that even the alarmed are desperately seeking is meaning. What does this really mean? Help me understand, what does one degree mean? What does two degrees mean? What does three or four degrees mean? I know it's bad in an abstract way, but I don't really understand in a visceral way how is life going to be worse then than now. So that's the challenge, and scientists can do this. So my question related to the very first question that was asked. And we've established that the way that news gets out is different and in the sense that there's less media coverage. But then how does the news get out? And what I've discovered, I'm a science writer for an institute series. And when we issue a press release, it gets reissued around the blogosphere. And a lot of people pick up on it. We post it on Facebook. A lot of people read it. And I feel this is a missing link because Honestly, working for an institute, you are very much a typist of what the scientists would like to have said, but then he doesn't get to say it because it gets edited out, um, because we can't have anything that touches on advocacy. And I feel that here's this huge amount of information going out that then really doesn't contain some of your suggestions of how does this relate to health, national security, moral and religious economics, 
links to severe weather, it is soluble. This is a place where we could get the message out. And I really feel all the onus is put on scientists individually to talk to the journalists, most of whom aren't calling anymore because there's so, so many fewer of them. And this would be an issue that needs to be tackled in effective climate communication that institutes have to develop. You know, no, we're not going to say advocacy, but we do, as an institute, point out that it is soluble. There are some links to some of the things that mean something to the public. And I feel that that's the missing messenger in this whole puzzle, is the institutes. And they could be the trusted messenger. Surely, you know, the name of NOAA and NCAR could be acting as a trusted messenger, whereas really all the responsibility has been put on the scientists for, to talk to the few journalists that we hope will get the message that they're hoping to say and write up the story on the angle and the way they say it. And I think this is the missing gap that really needs to be tackled. How as institutes do we talk about climate change? You know, because a lot of information now is coming directly out through the institute via their press releases, reprinted on the blogosphere. I mean, I've had press releases that have pretty much been reprinted in New York Times. You know, these people are busy now. They don't have science reporters. Just reprint it, change it around a bit. The BBC did it with a press release I wrote last week. You know, so this is where we can be getting the message out. And I would be interested in what you see as the caveats to that approach or where you see the potential to be in that approach. So, can I respond quickly to that? Uh, just first of all, we we look at institutional trust, and NOAA, NASA, uh, EPA, DOE all have very high levels of trust from the American public. I mean, compared to congressional representatives, I mean it, it's no comparison. So there is high institutional trust. Um, on this issue of advocacy, however, I, I think actually there is so much you can do before you ever even get close to that gray line. There's so much you can do because there's a science to the solutions, too, that you can talk with absolute freedom and credibility and you can still be a good scientist and yet you can still express the enthusiasm with what some of these things are. So, I mean, a lot of it. Yeah, I think there are actually different forms of communication, and if you look at the websites of some of these institutions, actually they are doing that, so. Um, I, I was just wanting to suggest too, and also to get your comments about um, other allies in addition to the, um, the ag schools and the health um, folks are also artists and entertainers, I think, and and in particular because th there's been a, a lot of uh, studies now that have looked at at health and how entertainment education has been really successful in getting um, health messages out to particularly to third world countries. But there isn't that same kind of focus here in the United States. And I know that Hollywood Health and Society, which is a a part of the um, U.S. Uh, no Southern California University of Southern California. California, the Annenberg Center, is working a lot now with television writers. Um, and the Neil Baer, who actually is from Colorado and was one of the writers with of ER, um, there's a, a tremendous uh, impact with TV writers as opposed to film writers because that you can see the the shows on television within a couple of months, which is really interesting. That are climate education informed, and so to just. Uh, uh, advocate to the scientists who are here who might be interested in working with theater or film or visual art or whatever um, is a great way to get the the word out in in different t that's more affective and I don't know Tony if you want to or any of you want to talk about that or Joni because of your experience with Tipping Point. I'll just very quickly say I, I mean I, I amen um, entertainment education and this is something I got pulled into uh, is probably the most powerful form of social of social change uh, yet invented in the in the uh, in the world. I mean, unbelievably powerful. And I got into this actually because when uh, 
Back in 2004, I saw that there, Hollywood was going to be releasing this movie called The Day After Tomorrow. Remember that movie? And I thought, wow, as a risk perception researcher, natural field experiment. So I actually got NSF funding to do a national survey two weeks before the movie played, four weeks after it played, and then four months later. And what did I find? That people who went to see that film were influenced by it for all the artistic license it took with the, uh, with the movie, and it did. Uh, no question about it. But nonetheless, big gains in awareness that the problem is real, that it's human caused, that it's going to have serious consequences. Perhaps most importantly, it shifted people from a conceptual model that global warming is this slow, incremental, gradual warming trend that someday will have dangerous impacts, and instead helped them understand that no, actually, the climate system exhibits thresholds and abrupt changes. And now, granted, they took a lot of artistic license with that idea. Um, but nonetheless, it got people thinking about climate change in a very different way. Um, and since then, I've learned more and more about this field, which has been used to tremendous effect, especially around public health, uh, to help people understand what's actually going on here. Because again, it takes, in its best form, it takes real science and puts it in the form of a human story. And now you got me. And now I can't wait to see what that character is going to encounter next. And it, it's incredibly powerful. Yeah, I, I just wanted to agree 100% with what you said. And I think a real compelling example just recently is the movie Chasing Ice. I don't know if any of you saw Chasing Ice. But uh, they have a number of uh, documented incidents where people come out of that movie maybe not even having an opinion one way or the other, and they are just transformed because it's so visually compelling. And it tells a really interesting story, and it also has a human angle to it. So there's, and it's a documentary film, so your audience and distribution is going to be limited by that. But I think that's an example of, of something that was kind of just a pretty low-key effort that ended up getting a lot of visibility because it was visually compelling and it did resonate with people that saw it. So you mentioned Tipping Point, which I think is a great program for bringing climate scientists and artists together on this issue. And I, after my tipping point experience in New York, a uh, person that wasn't attending but somehow got my name was a rapper who worked with Jay-Z and those guys contacted me and said, I, you know, he's passionate about climate change and he wanted to do a story on climate change. I sent him to tipping point. I don't know what happened. But uh, it was so cool. This guy, it was really like he used the real badass language the whole time. And then it was really interesting. I tried, I wrote back to him in sort of semi scientific language, and he wrote back in very scientific language. So he was very educated, whoever he was. Yeah, that, that's cool. And I really liked um, your perspective on the importance of telling stories. So, one of the ways that we found to have an impact was to seek out professional organizations where there's a concentrated interest in uh, understanding issues. And we were working with the uh, American Water Works. Association Research Foundation. And uh, when we first started working on this project, it was to create an educational primer for uh, the industry. Um, they, were, they were really cautious, you know, don't, don't say global warming. <laughs> um, but it turned out that um, the, uh, some of the major urban water utilities had stories to tell. They had experienced uh, climate impacts of one sort or another, you know, wildfires in uh, Denver's water system and, uh, and big floods and so forth. And they wanted to tell their stories and warn other people in their communities about, well, these are the kinds of impacts that you could experience, whether it's, you know, anthropogenic climate change or not, you ought to start thinking about how you might prepare. And starting with that entree, uh, that that whole organ, that whole industry has really taken climate change on as their issue, and there's now a water utility climate alliance, and they're you know a lobbying Congress, and, and so you kind of get a, a nose in the door and get them to tell their stories, and you can make a difference. I've been the um, cooperative climate observer in Boulder for 23 years, so I frequently get questions after significant events about how it's related to global warming. And that happened on May 2nd when we had the coldest temperature ever recorded in May, and that followed our snowiest April of record. So naturally I explain global warming exists, but there's still all the natural variability on top of it. When I'm asked how do we know the background has changed global warming, I have to admit the example I tend to go to for a global indicator is Arctic sea ice. 
And yet you seem to frown upon that particular example. I just wondered, is there a better example to use when you're explaining to local media how the background global indicators have shown warming? I, I think it's one of the best ones out there because it is, it, well, <laughs> somewhat, but because it is so visible. Okay, we can think about global temperature changes, but it's just an abstract thing that you put on a graph, right? It's hard to get a handle on it. Something like the Arctic sea ice change is visible, it's visceral. Uh, you know, okay, polar bears and seals and giant Arctic eels, you know, all suffering. But uh, it, it, it is, that, is, that, is that visible, visceral thing that people can relate to. So, in the one hand, the Arctic is our friend in this regard because, you know, it, the Arctic is telling us the change is here now. It's not in the future. It's not out there 50 years. It's here and now. And people seem to get that. I think, you know, for me, I, I uh, when people have asked me about that, and I'm not an expert on the beetle kill, I just say that it's an image, it's something that you can visualize as the kind of changes we can see in the future. Because I work on ecosystems and because climate change causes these sort of interesting impacts that regardless of whether it is pinnable on climate, you use it as an example of, of a future, to paint a future image. We, I'm with um, James Baylog. We have time-lapse video of beetle kill, and it's shocking to watch. It's like, what, two and a half, three-month periods. Some, some are four or five-month periods. And whenever we show them to people, it, they're stopped dead in their tracks. They may cry. Um, it's, it's almost more powerful, at least in Colorado, more powerful than the ice. So I don't have them up on our website yet, but we'll see. We're talking about getting them up there, but just wanted to point that out. Well, maybe it's a good question to end on. I wonder if you could say more about what you think the relative importance of your fifth idea, that there's hope, um, is in our communication strategy. It can be a scary message, and it, it can stop people. They don't want to deal with it. Um, so. Can you say more about that, and maybe, how to, you know, how do how do we incorporate more of that? Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll try to be brief about it actually, because there's a very large literature, especially rooted in the broad field of communication, but in particular health communication, that you need to have hope. Um, that as much as people want to focus on the problem and the impacts and the causes of the problem and so on, that, and let me reframe this as fear appeals. This is ultimately about the emotion that is being carried by the message as much as it is by the facts that you're trying to convey. But facts often have a big emotional impact. I'm sorry, ma'am, but you have cancer. Okay? That's a fact, but it's a fact with a really, really deep punch. Okay? Transforms people's lives to hear that. And so how you tell those facts, what emotions are being engaged by those facts, and how you help people process those in a constructive way is really at the heart of so much of this communication, because this problem does that. I mean, we all know this. I mean, when you sit next to that person on the airplane and they say, so what do you do? Oh, I work on climate change. Oh, that's nice. I mean, it's actually very hard to have the conversation because people don't want to go in there because all they know is doom and gloom and scary images and I don't know what's going to happen and I don't want to go back in there. Okay? So it's, I mean, and so what we find when you look at fear appeals, fear appeals are really useful and effective at getting people's attention. We as a species evolved and only survived because we have fear built into our most basic uh, structure, right? I mean, when you're walking through the woods in Colorado and you hear a crack of a stick behind you, your body immediately is ready to take action, right? That's a potential visceral immediate threat. Saber-toothed tiger about to jump on you. Um, 
And so you're ready, prime for action. But if you don't give people an immediate response, here is something effective that you can actually do to address that, that fear, then the tendency is to say, okay, deer in the headlights, I'm going to go par paralysis, or I'm going to avoid gaze. I don't want to look at that because it's too scary. I don't know what to do. But if you can twin it with something that here is something that you can do, here is something that we collectively can do, here's a reason for how we're going to actually solve this problem, um, then you begin to actually engage people in a much more constructive way. So I think that's really our challenge, is how to not only deliver the bad news of what's happening, but to do so with a really positive message of not only that we can solve this problem, but I would actually ask us to start reframing it more broadly and saying, we're actually trying to build a better future. Not a better future than the hell that we're saying we're heading to in 50 years, but a better future than the one we have right now, because it ain't so great for most people right now. People feel that the that our control of our lives and our ability to live the lives that we want and to hand on to our children the kind of life that we had is falling away from us. So this is actually, I think, part of a much broader narrative. We've been talking about climate change, and I've worked on climate change for 25 years. These all have been working on even longer. It's a crucial issue. We've got to get it right. But in the end, it's only one component of the real challenge of this century, which is the sustainability challenge. How do we live with probably 9 billion people on a single planet without destroying the life support systems that we all depend on, and yet providing everybody with dignity and a basic substantial uh, quality of life, and the ability to actually try to achieve their own dreams. That is our challenge. That is it. And climate is only one piece of that story. Just to add to that, from my perspective, what I also find useful is a bit of pragmatism. Okay? That we are where we are, and we're going to have to deal with it. That uh, we built this great society, maybe not all of it's great, on fossil fuels, cheap energy. All of the infrastructure we have, all of the comforts we have were built on that. We did that, but we didn't know it was a trap. So now we got a problem, and let's start dealing with it. Well, I, I did mention the movie Chasing Ice, and I think the, the guy who could tell a lot of uh, war stories about science communication is the director of Chasing Ice, Jeff Orlowski, who's actually here today. So if you wanted to talk to him more, he could probably tell you a lot about his experiences in communicating this particular issue to uh, in, in an entertainment uh, context. So I just have one thing to add to that, and that is you do want to be hopeful, and you want to tell people about solutions, but you still need to tell them that even in some small way they need to participate as Jerry said, just be cognizant of who you're voting for. Because some I've seen people turn off to say, oh no, we're working on it, there is things we can do, and then they're like, they fall into that category where they, that 7% that doesn't care, somebody's handling it, that they are handling it. And so I, th I think we have to, you, you still have to plant that seed to say they, they're responsible in some small way to help through this. So. That's a great way to end the thoughts on action and, and hope. <laughs> so um, I want to I want to thank David Harwood. He really helped put this together. So thank you very much with good works. <laughs> and thanks to the folks at NCAR for pulling this together. I, I think it's been terrific. What a, and what a great audience. And I know we're having lunch right outside of here, right? So we can keep this conversation going. And thanks to you. That was really fantastic. Thanks. Thank you.